Howdy, it's Mr. Pete again, your YouTube shop teacher, and today with tips number 534, which is part 5 of the Mead Band Sander Rebuild Restoration. Now the ball bearings came in for the upper wheels, so I'm ready to install them, so let's get going. Alrighty, you know we had no mail on Monday, but it was a Veterans Day, so finally the, the bearings came. There they are. Hope they're the right ones. I'm sure they are. I pretty, had pretty good luck buying bearings over uh, eBay. So the first thing I need to do is to remove the shaft. And I've already measured the length here exactly so that I know how far to press the shaft back in. Otherwise it would just be a little guesswork. So out comes the shaft and then out come the bearings out of the wheel. Well that wasn't too bad. The shaft pressed right out of there. Now I need to knock those two bearings out. And I'm just going to use a piece of brass rod at an angle. Straddle the vise. I think it'll, it'll work. But I have to knock one out <coughs> before I can get at the other one. There doesn't seem to be a spacer in between the two. You know what, I just set this over the vise, and that one actually fell out. So I think I'll have to install the new one, probably with a little bit of Loctite. And there is a spacer in there between the two bearings. Can you see that? That one's a little tighter. I'll just straddle the vise with that. Came right out. I'm going to warm this up on the hot plate. Expand it and see if the new bearings will drop right in without banging on them or pressing them. I would use the Arbor Press. I don't like to reinstall them with a hammer. On second thoughts, I'm not going to shrink them in there. It's such a loose fit for both of them that you can put that right in. So I'm going to clean this up real well inside and I'm going to clean the bearings because they've got chipping grease on them. And I'll clean it with brake cleaner. And then I'm going to use, where is it here? Some of the Loctite retaining compound, 638, to retain them. Which also means that I can't probably press the shaft in right now until, at least until this sets up. I believe you all know that Loctite is an anaerobic, meaning that it sets up in the absence of oxygen, right? And this bottle's about empty. You know, these bottles are half, only half full when you buy them. I used to feel cheated until I realized why. Why they do that. And now the other one. Okay, I drove the shaft into the new bearings according to the original measurement that I took when I removed it. So I'm spot on. That's how I determined that. Now it's ready to install. Now remember that this is a 3 8 hole here. This is a 3 8 slot. We've got two holes there. You recall that that is the mechanism for tracking the, the belt on the wheels. And that is so, when we put that in, that this can be moved one way or another until you get the tracking. Alright, let me put a belt on it and see if I can get it to track. Remember that some belts are marked with an arrow, meaning that they have to revolve or move in that direction, depending on how the joint is made on these. Some of them, it doesn't matter, but on this particular one, because of the way it's spliced, if you put it on backwards, it's going to peel the slice off. 
I suppose everybody knows that, but I'm just repeating it. It's so easy to change belts on this. Wow, it's really quiet. Just a little bit off, so I have to make an adjustment. I'm surprised how quiet it is. You see, it's just a little bit off. On both wheels. I'm going to monkey with the two pan headed screws here and see if I can get it to track perfectly. Just a warning now that these belts are very dangerous if you run your fingers up along the side of, of them. You can, they can cut you, so be very careful. And I've got to have the thing on while I make the adjustment. That's the problem. Also, I have an open V belt down here that I have to be careful of. See how I can move that back and forth? I think I got it just the way I want it, and then I would tighten this one. So it looks quite good. Well, maybe just a little bit on the bottom yet. But that also may be due to the fact that are the two wheels perfectly in line from left to right? Perhaps I need to put a washer between the lower wheel and the body to, to move it out. So there's a lot. Or maybe it will never track. Maybe the entire frame on this is not that accurate. It's just stampings. And that might have been good enough when they manufactured it. I'm just surmising that. Using this 24 inch stair rule, I'm going to check the alignment between the two wheels. And offhand, that looks pretty darn good, but when I put this against the upper one, I have about a 30 second gap here. So I'm going to move the lower wheel out a little bit. Loosen it up and move it out perhaps a 30 second. See if that makes any difference. All right, I moved that lower wheel in this direction, one thirty second of an inch. Then I had to retract here just a little bit, and it's just about perfect now. Also, I'm very pleased with how quiet it is. So we know that the upper bearing is making no noise because those are new bearings. And even though I had my doubts about the lower bearings, they're just fine. All right, I loosened up these two screws and then aligned the platen just a little bit better with the belt and, and that's uh, A-OK. -okay. Now that the upper wheel is done, I have to turn my attention to the work table on here. Now I could very well just make some little tool rest, and this is the one off the 2x48 that I just built. A little tool rest like this probably would be just fine. You could tilt and all of that. After all, that's what the Kalamazoo has on it. And they made a million of those. But here's an original picture that I took off the internet of a Mead sander. So it's got a table. This is cast iron. It looks like that. Also, I took some pictures from underneath. Wrong way, Corrigan. To show the bottom of the table. That's looking up from a worm's eye view and showing the bracket and how it's attached and how it will tilt. I think there's one more. That's also looking up from the bottom. So I've decided to make a pattern, make a casting, and uh, fit it up to the mead. In looking at the original paper, paperwork here, you can see that the table was seven by eight and a half. So that's pretty handy that I know that. And it just so happened I had a piece of cardboard in stock, bristle board or whatever they call it, that size. How fortuitous was that? So I cut a slot in it and glued a piece of wood on there just so I can think out loud and see how that will fit up. Now I did that quite a while ago and I determined that's the size 
that I want and that's about the location of that lug. I'm going to call it a lug. Now all I have to do is to make a pattern. Now this could also have been done with say 3 16 steel plate or aluminum plate and a lug screw down there. Just a lot of different ways of doing it but for some reason I felt like making it out of aluminum since I am a foundryman of sorts. I made this pattern oh, a couple months ago. This project's ongoing. So all it is is a piece of quarter inch Baltic birch and this is screen door trim put all the way around it and then my leather fillets and I really went through this as fast as I could to get it done and and I only make one of these so I just hate to take a lot of time for to make a pattern but as it is I probably spent three or four hours on this 3D printing would have been great but again I would have had to ask somebody else to do that and that would have taken some time and then the printing so anyway it's done now why didn't you mold the slot in there while you're at it you ask well that would have taken extra time because remember that everything on a pattern has to be tapered that is a pattern draft on it so I thought well it's just as easy to cast this solid and then saw that out and then mill it probably faster than taking the time to do that in the wood and then the, these two sides that I'm gripping also will be milled off so they're perpendicular and a hole, a cross hole drilled in here. So what I'm going to do at this time, since the casting has really already been made, I did film that a month or two ago. So I will cut to those uh, video clips now of molding and pouring. I didn't show all of it, but at least you get the idea. And if you watch me or follow me on Instagram, you might remember me casting this on Instagram, pouring it and all that. So some of that footage is the same. So let's take a look at that. I'll get back to you in a few minutes.
Well, I'm back already. And there it is, a finished casting. And you might recall that I did a couple of wheels while I was at it. Well, those are all already done, but I, I told you I always like to have spares. Now that's a pretty good surface there. I have no intention of machining it, although Meade machined theirs. And at the high school, I used to machine these. They would have been very similar to this on the Peterson Products band sander. I have talked about this many times, but there's the original Peterson Products band sander that also used a 1 by 42 inch. And you can see the pattern laying there. So you realize that what I'm doing here is very similar to that. And here are the full instructions. I've shown this before too. And you know what? I really would like to at some point resurrect this and make some patterns and and uh, do this whole project on YouTube because this is one that could be made by everybody out there that has a machine shop and is watching. Whereas you're not going to be able to make this mead sander. This was my complete line of uh, products with Peterson Products and I was at the same workbench. See the outlet right there? Same outlet 30 years ago or more. And uh, there were a total of 10 projects, but let me zoom in. This is probably one of the very few pictures of the Peterson project, uh, Products band sander right there. With the motor and it's on a board with a switch and all. There I am when I was in my prime, if I ever had a prime. And of course I'm not going to show you my face because I was, uh, I have to confess, I was quite a dork back then. But again, there is the band sander. There also was a disc sander and a bandsaw. And you can see the other projects. Well, that's enough talk about Peterson products. Let's get on with the mead. Is everybody happy? Sometimes I used to do that at school. And then the kids would, <laughs> would yell out, yes! There'd be a few that would say, no! All right. This is what the casting looks like. This was my prototype. I just cast two of these. This is the first one. I went ahead and sawed this out. That has not been milled, but just to see how it's going to fit up. And it fits pretty nicely. And now, taking a straight edge, you can see that it's pretty flat. I would expect there's a little shrink right here because it's on the opposite side of the lug. And yes, there is some shrinkage there. At the high school, we did machine these, as did Mead. I think I might have said that. And on a large enough lathe, this could be held in a four-jaw chuck and faced off. Well, some of the ones that we cast had extra lugs on the side, four lugs that could be used as hold downs. And we would sweep this with about uh, three passes of a fly cutter. It came out pretty nice. I'm not going to do that for this purpose because an abrasive machine is kind of a, you know, a, a semi-accurate machine to start with. The, the kind of work you can do on here isn't all that accurate. So the table doesn't really need to be. The platen is about one inch wide. Of course, it's a one inch belt. And this one I made one and three sixteenths, which I think is just a hair wide. I'm never going to use this one anyway. So I've just laid out this one one and one eighth wide. And I'm ready to saw it out. And I don't know if I should also mill it or not. There should be a 45 degree angle. Probably won't make sense to you at the back end here. In other words, it should slope at 45, something like that, so that the table can be tilted. And that only the leading edge on the other side comes close to the belt. And these tables were very subject to damage by the belt when the belt would shift from one side to the other, which it often did. So these machines self-destructed. I already showed you some of the parts that are partially ruined because of that. Notice that uh, how I lucked out here uh, that the gate is pretty much in the center of this so I don't even need to file that off. What a coincidence, huh? I laid out two uh, 
half inch circles there so I'm going to drill a couple half inch holes actually these are oversized such that uh, it makes it easier for me to turn the bandsaw blade and come into a corner you know that from your woodworking ready to saw Well, that's just about enough fun for today. I'll see you in part six where I set the table up here on the milling machine and do a few of the finishing operations. Then I drill the hole and get ready to mount this in part six. See you then.